It's Mark Yegi here, Wealth Architect and Lifestyle Investor. Let's take your life to the next level. Welcome to the Wealth Architect Podcast. Is the founder and CEO of Valkyrie Capital. It's a boutique firm for high net worth and high, high uh, income individuals that specializes in a seldomly invested but well-known property type that performs better than most others. And having started his journey in private markets back in 2012, this gentleman has successfully been involved with over $55 million in assets under management through acquisition, development, repositioning, disposition, strategic planning. And it's going to be really exciting because this is one of my favorite topics. Let's welcome Travis Bauckham. Travis, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing fantastic. Glad you're here. And I, I'd like to hear how'd you, how you got into your first deal. Let's jump right into it because yeah. that's usually a pretty good story, right? Yeah, my first, uh, so I'm in the self-storage space, but when I got into uh, real estate, you know, everyone, you know, easiest one to get, easiest asset class to get in, into is uh, residential. So I bought a HUD home straight from the MLS back when you could do that. You could get really good deals off the MLS. Um, okay. 2012, we, uh, we bought it, we fixed it up and had it rented out before my first mortgage payment was due. And uh, we really liked that model. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we did essentially had zero money out of pocket. We had a really favorable bank, gave us essentially 100% loan to value or yeah. loan to cost. And uh, and then we had it rented out before we had to pay um, a mortgage. So we thought, man, this is great. We should do this as many times as they'll let us. And so that was my that was my first deal. And then uh, and then we went on and did uh, because we liked it so much. We went on and did 400 other deals after that. Wow. And you both, you've done this all in the last 10 years, huh? From what I'm picking up? Yes, sir. Uh, two, that was 2012. And then we we bought most of those houses uh, from 2012 to 2018. Realized that uh, my wealth goals were not going to be met unless I switched over to uh, commercial. Yeah. I didn't really like, I had owned a couple of apartments. I did not like having just a, you know, a lot of people under one roof, uh, it's a lot of issues at those uh, smaller apartments I had. And so I, I, I'm like, if a 20 unit apartment has this much issues and a hundred units apartment is probably going to have five times as much issues. And so I chose to go a different route, kind of the non-habitable uh, real estate right, route. And we started buying storage facilities um, around 2021. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of rentals in 2018, had to sell all those off. And then we took that money and started buying uh, storage facilities with it. So Robert Kiyosaki would be proud, right? If you've ever played the game cash flow, he's got yeah. these small deals and he's got big deals and you've moved into the big deals. And you're in one of my favorite spaces. I'm not a big real estate guy, although um, I do have a bit. And uh, if I were going to continue to do more real estate, it would be in self-storage and mobile home parks. Those are the two things that I just think are phenomenal businesses. I'm over in Athens, Greece right now. You cannot find a self-storage business here. They just culturally don't do it. But right. when you look at what we do in the United States and, and other places, it's crazy how much self-storage we we use. It's just it's just a mind-boggling business for me. So yeah, Americans don't like to throw away things. And so and you know, this sentimental you know, Americans have a lot of wealth. They have, you know, collectively compared to other countries, you have a lot of uh, culturally, you have the inability to throw things away because they have sentimental value. And then, you know, because, and then we have like, then we like toys as well. And so all those things accumulate to, uh, uh, you know, needing some sort of extra space to be able to put our stuff. And so I heard it's an interesting a great, it's a great take on, um, on the, the reason that we don't th throw things out. And it's probably everywhere because I have some friends that don't throw stuff out either. It's that we put so much emotional investment into buying stuff, not just the, per the, the regular investment, but they like picking out, a, you know, a, you know, a pair of shoes or clothes or, a, you know, whatever, anything. And so we have all this investment mentally in it. That as soon as we throw it out, it's like we're throwing out a part of our identity. So we just don't throw stuff out. We rather store it and then throw it out 10 years later after it's out of style or something. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, good for you because you're in the business that uh, that helps people do that. So that's really cool. So how do you structure these deals? Obviously, they're different from the, the first house that you told us about just a second ago. How do you structure these deals? How do they work? And um, and are they easy to find? Uh, de deals are getting harder to find uh, every day unless your just risk threshold's really low and you just want to buy anything and you just hope that it works out 
if you're actually trying to make money, it's it's things are getting more difficult uh, every every month when the Fed meets. It gets more and more difficult to find a deal because your yield is getting suppressed. Your yield is maybe even going away. We've had deals that were really good deals, and when we, you know, six months after we started working on that deal, they weren't a good deal by the time you know uh, Jerome Powell met a couple more times, and so. Yeah. Um, as far as structuring it, we it, we tend to structure them through um, uh, you know general partnerships. So general partner, limited partner, a syndication model is the most common used term that we use. Uh, we'll uh, we'll take a portion of the equity, um, typically uh, do all the operations, take on the debt, and then we give a good chunk of the equity to our private lenders or private capital that want to uh, contribute you know anywhere from twenty five grand to two hundred fifty grand per deal. Uh, and then on the back end, typically those are paying a six to eight percent cash and cash that's been suppressed over the last year. And then uh, and then when we sell, they're getting an 18 to 22 percent internal rate of return. Wow, pretty, pretty impressive. And um, do you operate these or do you have an operating company or do you kind of on an individual basis, you know, let somebody live there and let them operate? How, do, how does all that stuff work? Yeah, we definitely don't want anyone to live there. That you, you, you know, going back to that non-habitable thing. I want that. I'm, I'm a purist on that. I don't uh, want. I don't even want my manager to stay there. Um, but the uh, we, yeah, most of the time we tear down the management uh, quarters uh, on those or convert it to units. But uh, typically, we depending on where it's at. If it's a super rural area that we're we're buying a facility at or a collection of facilities, we'll have an office um, where someone stays at you know, 30 hours a week or so. Uh, but most of them we run remotely. We have, um, we run it through a call center out of a small town in Lufkin, Texas. Um, and um, basically each, one, we have typically women that are in charge of each of one of the facilities as the manager. They make sure that rents have come in, that uh, overlocks are getting put on, uh, the gates are working, uh, fences are getting torn down, security cameras are working, and then making sure they're really driving home the uh the 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 uh the bookings that sort of thing uh they, for every unit they fill up they get 10 bucks and then you know for a stay home mom or someone who's retired that's that and you know if they do five of those it's 50 dollars. that's a that's almost a week of groceries in some of these small towns of, for sure. of uh, texas so 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 let's so this is interesting to me because i walk in and i want to rent a you know garage size unit and there's nobody on site from what I'm hearing from you. There's somebody that's remote. How are they going to let me in? I guess you're going to give me a code or something. And, and Yeah. Uh, the, every facility has a huge sign that has a QR code or a, in a website and a phone number. So like wow. depending on if you want to talk to somebody, you can call them and, and rent a unit. Uh, if you just want to click a QR code, you can rent on all of our facilities. You can rent without ever talking to a human being. Wow. Uh, it'll uh, All we have to do on the back end is finalize it. And we tend to call you just to double check that you're a real, real person and not some sort of bot. Um, but you can you can sign a lease. You can sign. Uh, you can add your credit card information. You can put your insurance information on all online without ever having to talk to a human. It's great. That's really cool, actually. I, I had not expected that. And then when somebody doesn't pay and you um, and you've got to put a lock on their unit, I guess there's somebody on site that, that uh, they call and they change the locks. Hey, it's Mark Yegi, author of this book on covered calls, here to tell you about my cash flow machine trading program that's designed to show you how I make safe, reliable income. Now I shoot for two to 4% a month of income in my portfolio, and we have courses to teach you how to do this yourself or inside a mastermind community. And the best part of it is that it only takes me about 20 minutes a week, maybe to an hour to implement. Now, while two to 4% a month may not sound like much, I show you exactly how I took my IRA from $111,000 to over 700,000 in just 23 months without huge risk. Yes, I got a little lucky, I gotta say, but I'm not telling you this to brag, just to show you that you could do this too. So to learn more about this program, go to cashflowmachine.io or better yet, go to this link to get access to videos and masterclasses that explain the entire process, the risks and rewards even more. See you there.
Yeah, we have a like a fractional facilities manager, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah. So someone that comes and checks on it at least once a week. Uh, most yard, uh, if there's yard, we we tend to try to get rid of all the vegetation. So they'll spray wow. for weeds. They'll spray spray. They'll blow the the aisles down so that if there's any trash, uh, they'll throw away stuff they need to throw away, and then uh, they'll show up and put locks on for any unit uh, for any tenant that hasn't paid. Dude, you've thought of everything. Like, that's awesome. I just, I just love it. It's almost, it's almost turnkey and such a, sounds like such a great business to run. Um, and what happens when they don't pay and you got to auction off their stuff? Yeah. And you know, the typical thing, that's a great, actually compared to other pieces of real estate, other asset classes, that's a great thing because it's a non-habitable uh, property. So you don't have to go in front of a judge to get permission to kick their stuff out. You just have to post um, in, in Texas, at least you just had to post uh, in a newspaper after, if they're 15 days late, you can post the newspaper. And then seven days later, you post the newspaper again. And then, uh, and then at that point you just hi uh, hire an auctioneer to, uh, auction their stuff off. There's websites you can do it through, uh, like late to lean.com. You know, um, we don't use any of those. We use live auctioneers because they're, it's just kind of one way we do it. And then, um, but yeah, you can, you can kick their stuff out or you can get their stuff out and someone can pay pennies and a dollar for a whole bunch of stuff that no one else wanted. And then typically we make the person who won the auction uh, sign a lease. So we have a tenant immediately. So we have zero, <laughs> for the most part, we have zero days lost uh, of, wow. of revenue. And so we don't have any vacancy law. We have, you know, a little bit, but generally speaking, it's uh, very low compared to like a house or an apartment where you have to go and paint, put new carpet down, maybe put some new cabinets up um, and who else knows what. But yeah, the uh, the great thing about storage is a very efficient model. You don't have a lot of overhead. You don't have a lot of, it's very top flight. And then when you act in the rare occasion that you have to kick someone's stuff out, um, it's also very efficient. So yeah, you've got, a, you've got everything uh, covered, it sounds like. And so your model is not to teach people how to find a self-storage building, buy it, uh, you know, mow down all the, all the aisles of vegetation and, you know, put in these QR code systems. From what I'm hearing, your model is to find investors who are interested in some passive income. You own and operate the property, but share it back with the GPs or the the, the partners, right? That's that's exactly true. Uh, we want we aren't educated at this point. We're not educators. We we want to uh, continue to buy. We we want to continue to operate the facilities and then sell them later later on at a cap. We we tend to sell all of our facilities. Our specialty is buying in kind of tertiary market where no one else is buying. Uh, going in there, improving rents 20 to 40 percent within a short time, you know, 12 to 18 months, and then uh, typically list listing it for self or someone else to kind of take on the rest of the um, bulk of the operations. Wow. And so, what is it that you guys do that maybe nobody else does? What makes you so special? <laughs> it's it's not it's it's a really low hanging bar as, as far as special goes. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a, there's not a lot of uh, ingenuity in in uh, self storage, but one one thing I would say is that we tend to want to buy uh, properties that have not only do they have lower mark than market rent, but they also have expansion rooms. So we could go in and put modular units. So if I were to build a facility, uh, that typically takes six to nine months, depending on the jurisdiction and the con you know that sort of thing. Uh, with modular units, you can. We just did one, and it took a it took nine days to go from uh, dirt work to being able to rent a, a, a unit out. And so, uh, so we really are trying to always try to make it more efficient. But I would say if there's something that we specialize in, we specialize in adding expansion units through modular units uh, quicker than everyone else, so that we're like eliminating the the six months to nine months that it takes, and then to fill it up. And so. Wow. And so a modular unit is what? One of those Butler buildings or is it uh, a building that you actually, you know, build on site with metal or you just bring it on site and it's already ready? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. It actually comes on a truck. You can put 10 of these, uh, you know, basically 10 by 10. Uh, you can get two 10 by 10s or one 10 by 20. Um, each is one is one unit and you can get 10 of those on a truck. So we'll come, we'll do the dirt work, wow. typically, uh, you know, caliche or, you know, crushed concrete. And then we'll put the units run on the, they build them on site takes about a day to build them, to build all of them. We just put 60 yeah. units, 60 of these in a, a you know, mid-sized town in Texas. And we're already, they're already on our website for you to rent. And that, that started less than nine days ago. 
That's amazing. That's amazing. And it, and and they and they man, they look they make the facility, they make an older facility look so sharp because they're not cheap. They're they look just like a once you trim them out, they look just like an existing like an actual facility. Okay. So it's it's great. Yeah. And I suspect the permitting is a lot easier since you're just popping something on the ground. Well, it, it's not considered real estate, so it's not you don't have to get it yeah. permitted. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Wow. Okay. So what am I? I mean, this sounds too good to be true for a lot of people, I'm sure. So what am I? What am I not asking you that I should be asking you? How about that one? <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, it 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 really is as as good as it is. The hard thing is um, the the deals are slowly going away just because of you know when you're borrowing money at nine percent and you're. Yeah. You know, a seller wants a six percent cap uh, for a sale. You know, it, it makes it challenging when, when it, when a when a seller wanted a six cap and you could borrow money at five point seven five. You're like, oh, this is still makes sense because we're going to raise rents and make this thing at eleven cap. But when you're borrowing at nine nine percent, you're trying, you still can make an eleven cap. Your yield is so so much smaller. I would say if for your listeners, um, whether it's me or someone else, just make sure that you're really diving into the numbers. Because right now, um, if if a pro forma is not showing a, a suppression in interest rates, I mean, you know, like if it's not nine and a, your exit interest rate is eleven, um, if it's not if, you, if you're not using that, then typically uh, you're you're probably um, you probably have a syndicator that's a little bit too ambitious, and so um, that's something that someone is going to need, need to pay for uh, pay attention to. I don't think we're going to be very aggressive on rents over the last two years. We've been able to raise rents like anywhere from 20 to 70% per facility. Yeah. I don't think we're going to be able to do that uh, over the next 12 to 24 months, maybe 5% per year, which still shows the yield. Um, the, the juice is going to be, or the return is going to be made in these modular units, expanding properties, uh, you know, buying up the, the entire, uh, trying to buy up the entire market in a small town as opposed to like buying just one facility. Uh, you're really, it's been pretty easy for syndicators and other investors. Uh, I think it's going to get challenging. Uh, you're really going to have, you're going to see people separating from, you know, things just working out because the market's going up and things just working out because they're really smart and they've really done all their sure. you know, due diligence and stuff. And so you don't think our inflation envir inflationary environment is going to continue to translate to higher rents? We are not underwriting substantially higher rents. Uh, we are underwriting like we're, we're we're trending with inflation, so four to eight percent. But we aren't going like, oh, well, next year we can raise twenty percent, then the next year after that we can raise twenty percent, which is what we've been able to do for the last few years. Um, and so, and then you know, who knows if that inflation is going to catch up with the interest rate? And so, right. if the interest rate is also going up while you raise it uh, five to eight percent, then your your yield is still going to be uh, the same as it was if you if you didn't do anything to the facility. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it being in this rate interest rate environment. I can see it being close to upside down if you mess up the numbers. Yep. Yeah. And that's when you're losing money and you're not able to raise rents, you're not able to shave off something that gets real painful. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a big, that's a big one. That's where something could go wrong. If you don't know what you're doing, that makes sense. Um, wow. Okay, cool. Really good stuff. How do, how do people get a hold of you and, um, and, uh, and work with you? Yeah, the best way is through our website. Uh, it's uh, www.investinstoragedeals.com. If you scroll at the bottom, uh, there's a little small form you can fill out and we'll reach out to you. Amazing. Okay, so we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, any final thoughts? Anything you'd like to leave our listeners and viewers? Yeah, I, I, you know, given given what you told me about your listenership, I would say just be real. Everyone needs to be real careful on what, who they're investing in. Invest in people who are, have great track records and also in asset classes that have amazing track records. Storage has the best track record. If you're, uh, when it comes to real estate, they have a 40 year track record that outperforms all the other uh, asset classes. And so that's, that's what I'd recommend. Amazing. Well, listen, thank you for your time, your wisdom, for being on the show. I, I've learned a lot of stuff from you today and I'm actually fascinated by your business. So hope you guys reach out to, uh, to Travis. He's got some good stuff. Sounds like he's got a really good system and, uh, and uh, seems like seems like it can help you a lot. So, Travis, thank you so much for being on. And like I say to everybody else uh, who's listening and viewing, never give up your power in your health, your wealth, or your time. See you next time. Have a good day, everybody. And thanks, Travis. Thanks, Mark. You've been listening to the Wealth Architect Podcast with Mark Yegi. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Share and tell your friends. See you soon.